Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. J. Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, J. Warner Wallace. Thanks for joining me at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Today we're going to talk about how Jesus dealt with doubt. Now when I say this, I don't mean how Jesus dealt with his own doubts. I mean how Jesus dealt with people who came to him during the course of his three-year ministry and um, proclaimed a doubt or, or demonstrated a doubt or had a concern about the certainty of the Christian worldview or the certainty of what the things that Jesus had said. There were people who came to, him, came to him over the period of those three years who actually expressed some doubt, some hesitancy. And I want to talk about how Jesus responded to that because I think all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, at some point in our lives have had some concerns about whether or not what we believe as Christians is true. That is, even for someone like me, who is, has been, you know, from the very beginning as a Christian, very evidentially based. I mean, I, I, I took a hard look at every claim for and against Christianity before I ever became a Christian. But even having taken that approach, I can tell you that there are times when I also have to wrestle with my doubts. But this is also true, if you think about it, for me as an investigator. I've had to wrestle through my doubts about particular suspects, even when later on when they were convicted, they ultimately confessed to the crime. Well, there were times in that investigation and times during that trial when I had to wrestle with my doubts, my concerns. Like, you know, did I get this wrong? Did I get this right? Did I, did I, mispers- did I misunderstand this piece of evidence? And then, of course, you, you work with a certain level of confidence. I had confidence that I was well beyond a reasonable doubt as to this being the proper suspect. And in the end, when this guy was convicted, he actually confesses to it. Well, then you have your, your, your reasonable uh, conclusions are confirmed for you. But even when you have the truth and it's later demonstrated to you without any doubt at all that it's true, along the way to getting to that point, you can have doubts. And so all of us have had those about our Christian views. This does not mean that our Christian views are somehow inferior. As an atheist, I had doubts about my explanations for the beginning of the universe, my explanations for the origin of life. All of us, regardless of worldview, at some point will have some doubts about what it is we believe. And that's what we're going to talk about in today's broadcast. We're going to talk about how Jesus, when confronted with doubts, dealt with them. Now, I'm going to start by doing something I've done in the past in these worldviews, in these these, uh, broadcasts, and that is I'm going to make a case for the evidential nature of Christianity first. Uh, starting with the actual words of Jesus. Jesus, in my view, and I think demonstra- as demonstrated in Scripture, was clearly an evidentialist in the sense that he didn't ask people to believe something, to listen to him, to take him as authoritative until he first demonstrated his authority by way of performing a miracle, something that would lay the foundation evidentially for his hearers to know that they actually um, had good reason to trust the words coming out of this man's mouth. So you'll see this over and over again. So often did he first uh, uh, do a miracle before he would proclaim a truth. He would lay the foundation for this truth by first working a miracle. Then in the end, uh, in John, you'll see in chapter, I think it's chapter 14. Let me go here now, 14 verse 11. I'll read you this verse. It'll be on your screen. Uh, Jesus actually says to those who are around him, if you don't believe me, believe the evidence I've given you at least. He says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So what you have here is uh, Jesus saying, hey, look, I'm not asking you to believe this blindly. I'm not asking you, I'm not, this is not a test to see who can willfully push themselves through life, believing the claims that I've made to you without any evidence to support those claims. In fact, I've been working miracles in front of you as an evidence of my authority, of my deity, and it's such a support to be the foundation for my claims. And he often would say something like this in order to support his claims. As a matter of fact, it says in Acts verse 1, cha- uh, sorry, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, Acts 1, verses 2 and 3, it says, Until the day when he, Jesus here now, was taken up, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So here is such a um, high regard for uh, substantive uh, kind of proof 
that Jesus sticks around for 40 days, providing many more convincing evidences to the disciples that he has risen from the dead, knowing that, in fact, this is the evidence upon which they will later reflect in order to hold on to what they know is true. They will look back at the time they spent with Jesus and have great confidence that everything they, they experienced uh, is, really supports the mission they're about to take on, which you see later on in Acts, for example, in Acts 17, where I think this is Paul speaking. Yes, it's Paul saying here. Uh, this is in Acts 17, verses 30 through 31. Therefore, Paul's saying, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that, uh, that all everywhere should repent. Why? Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now think about that for a second. As a matter of fact, if you look back at the book of Acts and you track through how it is that the disciples uh, evangelized the world, they did it by way of their eyewitness testimony. As a matter of fact, it was their status as eyewitnesses that made them powerful in their communities. As a matter, you know, you think about this in Acts 1 when they're in the upper room and they're just trying to decide who should take the place of Judas. You know they were looking for somebody who had been an eyewitness of the life and ministry of Jesus all the way from the baptism through the resurrection. Why was that so important? Well, because what we need here are those who have been convinced on the basis of the eyewitness experience they had. They had evidences shown to them through the entire time they were with Jesus. Now they will be a piece of evidence themselves. As a form of direct evidence, they will go out into the community as eyewitnesses. So not only is um, the, the uh, ministry of Jesus uh, supported, grounded in the evidential nature that Jesus presented himself by saying that he, he have given you enough evidence here to believe what I'm saying. Then the next stage of the ministry of Jesus, the work of the disciples, is even further supported by the fact that they saw themselves as eyewitnesses. It starts with evidence, it ends with evidence. This is the nature of the Christian worldview. It's not done by way of a private vision. It's done publicly as a point of history in the public, in the public eye, in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, what's also interesting about that is that as a result of the kind of evidential nature of Jesus himself, you see that the foundation has now been laid for an evidential form of Christianity, which you see repeatedly. I'll look at my notes here. I'll show you on the screen here some of the verses that support that we are called to have a reasonable faith. Here, for example, is Jude 4 and verse 10. Verse 4 and verse 10. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for, their, uh, for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. The point here is that Jesus says we aren't to be like them, unreasoning animals. We are instead to be just the opposite, reasoning beings who use our reason to examine the evidence and come to a conclusion. You'll see this also, um, this kind of view of an examined faith in 1 Thessalonians, look at your screen, chapter 5, verse 19 and 21. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. And in John, you'll see in 1 John 4, uh, ch uh, chapter 4, verse 1, uh, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because the many false prophets have gone out into the world. Then go with me over to Romans um, chapter 4, uh, sorry, sorry, chapter 14, rather, verse 5. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. Now let's finish with 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 14. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Do you get the point of these verses? We are to examine, we are to investigate, we are to be convinced as a result of our examination, as a result of our testing, we are to be convinced. And this is the nature of the Christian worldview. We're not told, hey, just trust this, and if you start to question it or doubt it or you think you have to examine it, well, then you have a weaker faith. You've actually insulted the God of the universe. No, our God says, test it, examine it. Be convinced by, by the result of your testing and examination. That's the kind of Christian, uh, that's the kind of worldview that Christianity is. 
So given that's the nature of the, the kind of the basis for Christianity, how then did Jesus deal Need with that? Need a speaker doubt? for your next conference, retreat, training seminar, right or church break. service? Jim travels around the country, making the case for the existence of God, the deity of Jesus, and the reliability of the Bible. He'd love to partner with you to create a powerful, transformational training experience. Just visit the Cold Case Christianity website and click the Book Me tab. You'll find everything you need to know there, including a list of Jim's speaking topics, promotional materials, Jim's speaking calendar, and a link to connect with our team so we can book your event. In addition to Jim's daily blog and weekly podcasts and videos, Jim continues to write books designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. At coldcasechristianity.com, you'll find a link to Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels, and Alive, a cold case approach to the resurrection. These resources will help you defend what you believe and share it with others. Okay, so now I want to take a look at a couple of passages that um, uh, really kind of uh, demonstrate how Jesus dealt with doubt specifically. Now we'll take a look at the first one here in uh, the Gospel of John, where uh, Thomas, Doubting Thomas, the Doubting Thomas passage. Thomas comes and he has, seems to have doubts about whether or not Jesus is risen from the dead. And Jesus deals with those doubts. And he says something that I think the church has mistakenly, um, especially recently, errantly kind of interpreted as a, a confirmation of the kind of blind faith that we sometimes think of when it comes to uh, believing something is true, especially when it comes to believing something supernatural is true. And I want to read the passage to you and show you why I think that this verse has kind of been corrupted in some ways by the, the church in general, and then show you how I think that the, the, the passage itself demonstrates just the opposite, that Jesus did not expect us to have a blind faith, that in fact, that faith should be grounded and rooted in evidences. So let's take a look at this and the Gospel of John on your screen. This is uh, John 20 verses 26 to 29. Here's what it says. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, remember Thomas doubted earlier that Jesus was really alive. And here he is now, Thomas is with the group, having had earlier doubts. Here's what Jesus said. He then said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it in my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. It's this last line. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed that I think has become a point of confusion. It's almost as if it's on his face. Doesn't it kind of sound like it's saying, Hey, you saw me. Thomas, that's one thing. That's great. I'm glad you believe. But hey, there are people, people who don't see me. And if they believe, even without the evidence of having seen me, they're even more blessed than you. It almost sounds like this is an affirmation of a kind of blind faith, a faith in which uh, it's not grounded in evidence. It's just grounded in a trust that is somehow better than the kind of faith that Thomas had. That's where I want us to stop and take a good look. Remember, we are in the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 20 of, God, of John's Gospel. Earlier in the Gospel of John, we saw that vision, that view of John that we talked about earlier. Remember when he said, if you don't believe me, or that the Father is in me, at least believe the evidence of these miracles? Also take a look here at this verse in John 10. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. 